All right, what? Oh, we're doing this again? All right, listen, it's a two-parter. You, you listen to the first part, now this is the second part. Episode 76.5, if you will. This is our first ever two-parter, part two of our two-parter. You already listened to part one of episode 76. That's Elon and Twitter. Lots of details there. And now we're going to cover some more topics, including the global food crisis, China's plan to stockpile a bunch of food, geopolitics, all around the horn, French election, Germany, etc. And then we'll go into details about a little bit of the drama and details, pageanty, parties, poker, all the good stuff of the All In Summit coming soon. Okay, enjoy the show, everybody. I'll see you on Monday. There's uh, still a war raging, but uh, I wanted to get an update from Freeberg on the food crisis, which he um, predicted very early. Fertil fertilizer prices are still climbing like crazy. There's been some food rioting in China, which I think is a separate issue. He'll educate us in a minute, Sri Lanka. So what is your theory of what we're going to do from here, Friedberg, because I think we're all waiting for this shoe to drop. And I think you predicted this is something that we would experience into the fall and into next year. So when, so is, I, when look, are we going mean, to actually see these food riots occurring? And then is China's food riots have anything to do with this? Or does that have to do with they? Uh, like yeah, I, think food? I, I, I would put the Chinese food riots as kind of a separate localized yeah, okay. supply chain problem related to the lockdowns. Got it. But we're definitely, uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned last week, the USDA planting report showing in the US how acreage is being reduced on corn. And, and, and we're seeing this around the world where acres are coming out of production, or less fertilizers being used, which means less foods being made. So everything that we predicted, I mean, this is a slow train, a Titanic into the iceberg that we're watching right now. And it's going to continue for nine to 18 months. So, you know, one of the questions that people are now asking, which I said, you know, would become a really critical next step in this crisis, is how are we going to bridge the gap in calories? Where's the food going to come from? And how are we going to feed nations that are almost entirely dependent on imports that are running out of food or out of food? So I've mentioned this in the past, the whole world runs on a 90 day food supply, which means roughly 25% of the world's calories are in storage right now. But that's not the case uniformly. So some countries like Tunisia and Somalia, Ethiopia have close to zero calories in storage. Some countries, um, like uh, the United States are roughly, you know, 30, 40% of our, you know, annual consumed calories are sitting in storage. China is a complete outlier. For years, China has been stockpiling food. And at this point, China has 150% of their annual consumption of food in storage. So they have supplies that if all food production and imports stopped in China, they would be able to feed their population for one and a half years. That's an incredible supply of food. So as you look around the world to places like Sri Lanka and places like Somalia that are struggling to figure out how are we going to bridge this gap on calories that's about to hit us. Egypt's about four months of food, by the way, and Egypt is dwindling. They cannot get the food um, out of the Black Sea. So China is going to be one of the very few potential solutions for bridging the calorie gap over the next year. And I have a strong prediction and a strong belief that because of that, China will use it to maximal leverage and we will see over the next year, an incredible amount of leverage and power being accumulated by China, because of transactions that they're going to start to enter into to bridge the calorie gap around the world. So in the Horn of Africa, for example, there has been this continuous presence of China, trying to give themselves a military base trying to take a, um, uh, um, some influence over local media. Um, and there's been this kind of push and pull with, uh, you know, certain populations around whether or not we should kind of embrace China locally. And I think that, for example, the, uh, the food crisis that we're seeing emerge in Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea, Djibouti, is going to be resolved by China. And China is going to end up gaining influence, gaining military presence, and establishing a more permanent foothold in the Horn of Africa, because of the position that they're in of strength, with all these calories, and the, and the need in these regions. And that's not just there. Sri Lanka, other parts of Southeast Asia, even Western Africa, Northern Africa, China's going to show up. 
And they're the only country that can show up. The UN, the World Food Program, they're going to do everything they can to shuffle calories around, change food supplies. But I do think that one of the things that everyone's going to be watching, and it's, it's a slow roll. This isn't going to be some one big deal and everyone wakes up. Over the next year, while the US is you know, trying to do everything we can to maximally impose sanctions on Russia, China is slowly turning the crank around the world on the influence that they are going to gain because of this food crisis and the absolute um, uh, you know, surplus that they have locally and the ability to export that surplus to support needs around the world. And it's not going to be free. It's not going to be cheap. So I, I thought it was worth highlighting what we're seeing. And I shared a couple of articles with you guys and with Nick, articles that no one is paying attention to. And this isn't some conspiratorial, oh my God, there's some dangerous thing happening. I'm just pointing out one of the things that's happening as we talk about you know, the great change in power, the shift in power globally that's happening. It is happening in a very significant way this year, um, given the surplus that China has, the dearth that many countries have, and the inability for the US to, to really adequately respond to the food crisis that, that's emerging. Um, and so I thought it was worth bringing to everyone's attention. There's a lot of little articles that, that support this point. I shared them with you guys. You guys can put them in the show notes and, and put them up on YouTube and whatever. Um, but I think this is going to become a macro trend that we're going to wake up to in six to nine months and be like, whoa, what the heck happened? How, you know, how, how did China get so much leverage around the world? And, and, and it's, it's starting now. Zach, That's what happens with it? every war. You know, we all we go in hot. You know, we, it's, you know, rah, rah, we're all gung ho. And then at some point in time, we're like, wait a second, why do we do that? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and look, there's no shortage of, of neocons and liberal interventionists who are all saying this war is wonderful for us because it's reunited the American alliance and the Western alliance. And that this has been this war is a good thing for us. Let's keep it going. Let's bleed Russia. Let's topple Putin. Let's destabilize the regime. They, they're in favor of protracted conflict. That I've been, you know, warning against. And what Freeberg is saying is the longer this conflict goes on, the more of these disastrous scenarios are going to materialize. Uh, what do you what, what is your take on how crippled Putin is right now, David, just objectively? And again, you're not a fan of Putin. You're Listen, responsible yeah, for look, the war. I, You've I been clear any, about I, that. I, 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 but I he just lost the ship. Like, I mean, this does not look good for him. Um it feels like he can't, and he's losing all his tanks. I mean, this seems like a crazy I don't, I don't know anything it. you don't know in terms of, you know, I'm just a consumer of information. But I tend to think that we are overly optimistic in the West. And look, the war has clearly gone very bad for Putin. But this idea that everything, that magically we're going to get regime change in Moscow, we're going to get Gorbachev 2.0, that that is, that is an objective worth protracting this war for. Uh, I tend to think it's going to be a mistake. I mean, that that's now doesn't mean I support Russia's invasion. I've said it's illegal. It's a crime. It's a, a violation of international law. It's a humanitarian disaster. But what I've supported is a is a uh, negotiated peace, a settlement that we try to get as quickly as possible. That is clearly not the administration's position on this. They want to keep this thing going. And, you know, this idea that the, that a long war is good for America's alliances I would disagree with that because you're already seeing all over the world now, people are starting to object to American policy. You saw it with India. And India is the world's largest democracy. They should be on our side. They definitely should not be on China's side because they have a huge They're not. Uh, latent tension. But China and India are both de facto on Russia's side on this. Uh, Africa and large parts of Latin America. Well, India would like are, to have oil. And they, they like would like to maintain they are they would like to maintain yeah. their relationship with Russia and they did not support the denunciation of Russia. They would like to see this conflict end. Large parts of Africa would like to see it end, Latin America. Basically, all the victims, uh, if there's a famine in the world in six months, like Freeberg is saying, they are all very worried about this. All of them have expressed concern with the American policy, which seems to be to protract this war. Okay, and Freeberg, you have to go do your talk at Berkeley. Congratulations, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for the contribution. Chamath, any thoughts on the um, CPI? We, we set a record. That seemed to have gotten lost in the, the haze of Twitter. I learned, I learned something really interesting that I just wanted to share with you guys. Um, uh -huh. So there was a big CPI print, obviously, but there was a report, probably not many people read it, but it was about uh, home equity. And the takeaway was that since 2020, Americans have taken two, 430, I think the exact number is 427, 
$427 billion of home equity out of their homes and effectively spent it. So what it, what it started to make me think about was if you look at all of that home equity, plus the stimmy checks, plus the unemployment insurance checks, that starts to explain, I think, why the labor markets are so tight and why people haven't gone back to work. There is no motivation because there's just so much money sloshing around for them to basically not have to be forced to do any of this stuff that they don't want to anymore. And I think the the thing to keep in mind is like, that's also what's gone into the stock market. It's also what's driven up the price of used cars, new cars, all of this stuff. I just think that kind of like starts to paint a picture of CPI that's really important, which is that it's probably a little bit more transitory than we mm. may actually think. Because when you exhaust all of that extra money that's Dry in the powder, system, yeah. there's not as much inflation to be had. And I think most people are now forecasting that inflation is really going to taper off. And the big warning sign that everybody is sort of, you know, marching towards is, you know, too many excessive rate hikes between now and the end of the year could actually push us into a real recession. And we, we were talking about that before, but the probability is now sort of like one in three. Whereas before, I think, you know, David and I sounded a little bit crazy when we were talking about it. So I just wanted to put that out there as something I learned this week that I thought was really important. Worth the considering labor participation rate. rate peaked at 67, 68%. But half a trillion dollars of 61. home equity? I mean, half a trillion dollars of actual spending in the economy, that's a ton of money to be absorbed. Right. If people have a couple of hundred grand in their bank account who own homes or whatever, the, there's no need to go back to a job. And if you don't feel safe because you maybe still have some COVID fears, or you don't want to commute or you're just out of the rhythm for two years. And you're like, eh, I'm kind of enjoying skiing or whatever you're doing, whatever your jam is. Maybe there's no, there's no rush to get back. You'll, wait until, you, job. you'll wait until you exhaust all of that money. Yeah. This is a, this is a, and then we're not, as we talked about, we're not letting people into the country at the same time. So you still have 10 million job openings. If that flips, that would be economic activity. That would be helpful in fighting, uh, fighting against uh, a recession, correct? I mean, I, I, I think that, that we're probably going to have a, a quarter or two contraction. It, it, it's probably going to happen at sort of at the late end of this year, beginning of next year. Just the real question is how how high are rates between now and then? And again, I think the setup isn't very good, which is that the investors in the stock market are playing chicken with the Fed. And, you know, they're just at the beginning of a rate cycle, and they haven't been able to impact any real forms of liquidity in the equity market. And so I think they're, they're holding, gonna, they're gonna, they're going to attack that. And the only blunt force instrument they have is rates. And so, you know, you could see rates at three, three and a half percent. And that's going to impact a lot of stuff. And the problem is that, you know, uh, it's going to be after the economy has slowed down because it's going to be after a lot of these, you know, fake savings, if you will, um, have been depleted. Yeah, well, we're seeing some pressure come off as well. The car shortage is kind of ending and wages have raised. So that it seems like they're in, in this, you know, confluence of events, certain things are starting to work themselves out. Are you... Hey, bullish? can I tell you something else? I was, I was in Washington uh, this week. The number of people that listen to our pod, it is incredible. Huh. Uh, it's I mean, interesting, yeah. How many incredible. people in Washington care about our views on politics? It's incredible. The number I've heard of that people, feedback too. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really, really special. We've, we've stumbled into something pretty cool. And the fact that it's like must, it's, 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 uh, it's must listening. It's must listen at this That's point. It's like a Sunday weekly show. You just get a different perspective yeah. from yeah. the tech sector and capital allocators that maybe you don't yeah. get on us, you know, meet the press or something. Yeah. But just to follow up on that inflation point, the economic point, Jason, if I can. So, yeah, please. So, look, the main reason inflation is going to go down in the second half of this year is because inflation is measured on a year over year basis. And you remember about a year ago is when inflation started. But, you know, around this time last year, inflation was only two and a half percent. Then it reached. 5% by the summer, then by the end of the year, it was almost 8%. So as we sort of lap last year's inflation rate, we come up against, you know, you're comping against a 7.8% number last year. So I don't think inflation's going to get any better. We're probably looking at roughly a 12%, you know, official two-year inflation number. So in other words, since Biden took over as president, you're looking at probably 12 to 13% of total inflation as measured by CPI. 
And that is why, even though the headline number will come down later this year, I don't think the American people are going to feel any better about the situation. You can almost predict that Jen Psaki or whoever replaces her at the podium at the White House briefing room, they're going to be touting these lower inflation numbers at the end of the year. But it doesn't mean price levels will have decreased. Prices will still be very high. When people go to the grocery store, they buy meat or bread or what have you. It's going to be very expensive. And um, I don't think people are going to be feeling better off. And there's going to be a lot of negativity going into the November election for this administration. And also, I think it's going to impact consumption. I mean, if you're going to a gas station and you, I mean, I drove the minivan to LA uh, and it's the only electric, it's the only non-electric car we have. We happened to drive it because we had a number of people that was bigger than the X. And I, it was like shocking to buy $7 gasoline. And obviously I can uh, withstand, you know, filling up, but I could see people saying, you know what, maybe... I'm not going to make that incremental trip or, you know, you start looking at some of the prices, uh, you know, for taking a trip or flights. I don't know if you've looked at flights or hotels, like things are starting to creep up that it's like super noticeable and that's got to affect consumption. And then that would be what would be part of those negative two quarters, right, Shamath? I mean, the role of people stopping consuming and just saying, you know what? Yeah, it's too expensive right now. Just I'll stay at home and watch Netflix. Fuck it. You know, I'll cook pasta tonight. You you see that happening already. Yeah, people are starting to balance the balance sheet. Just looking at the balance sheet and saying, you know what, what's a way I can, you know, cut some expensive items off the, you know, I'll ride a bike. They're going to take less travel because, you know, the cost of airline tickets have gone up because the cost of the jet fuel has gone up. It all it all ripples through the economy. Um, but I think the thing is that when when the Fed gets involved, though, they get involved in a, you know in a brute force way. Let me make a prediction right now. If we're, he- we're we're definitely headed into an economic slowdown, I don't know if it will meet the technical definition of recession, but very high. Two chance. negative quarters of growth. Yes, the exactly. Technical. So I, yeah. you know, very high chance I think of recession. Like Jamal said, towards the end of the year, if this war is still going on and we get in a recession, look out below. I think this president will be in Jimmy Carter territory. He began the year at thirty eight percent. That was in reasonably good conditions of peacetime. If, you know, and I tweeted at the beginning of the year in January, I said that, you know, this is, you know, you're at 38%. That's with peace and prosperity. We'll look out below if we get recession and war. That's what it's looking like right now. So, um, you know, I think this is, things are looking pretty, pretty dire, which is why I keep saying it, you know, the policy of this administration should be to try and find a settlement to the situation in Ukraine, to this war. I know that we didn't start it. Putin started it. Let's be clear. But If there's an off-ramp here, we should be seizing it because we got real problems back home in America and the administration should be focused on our economy and our problems. Europe is going to be the canary in the coal mine on all of this because I think they feel this uh, pretty severely. And I think there's a, um, a lot of exhaustion amongst European governments and leaders when you start to listen to this rhetoric. To kind of, you know, find uh, a way to uh, end, end what's going on over there because the, they're going to see a pretty meaningful recession, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Much more, much more so than we will. Yeah, and if you look, if you look right now, what's happening in France? Marine Le Pen is surging, unbelievable against Macron. I don't know if she's going to pull off the upset, but one of the major pillars. Well, actually, here's what she's running on. She is saying that she has been focused on inflation and cost of living, and she says Macron has been distracted by being America's basically lapdog puppet, whatever on Ukraine. So she's saying we need to focus on the French economy. And she's also saying that we as France should set our own foreign policy and not be so differential to the US. She says that this protracted war in Ukraine and all this hot rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration about war crimes and destabilizing Putin and toppling him and putting him on trial at the Hague, that is not in French interests. That's what the Americans want to do, but it's not what we should be wanting to do. We need to end this war. And I'm not ready to say she's going to pull off the upset yet, but she is clearly articulating that message because she is finding purchase with the French electorate based on that message. And you're going to hear that if this war continues for three months and six months and Europe goes into a recession, you're going to start hearing uh, politicians all over the European continent saying the same thing and questioning American leadership and why are they are dragging this thing out. The, the thing that's the scariest thing about the French election and I'm not sure how many Americans uh, paid attention to it, but just to maybe summarize in a very quick nutshell, you actually had this really interesting dynamic of three candidates. One was what would be considered far left, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, 
one far-right Marine Le Pen, and then one that was very, very centrist, Emmanuel Macron. And what's crazy is both of these two were, you know, 22 plus percent of all of the votes. It was just that Le Pen and Macron were one and two. And so they go into a runoff election and, you know, Mélenchon was very clear. He was like, under no circumstance should any of my supporters vote for Le Pen. But it just shows you what's happening, which is like France, which is, you know, sort of coming undone under this populist fight, um, is probably uh, a canary in the coal mine for how this stuff could play out in other places. And it's kind of scary. It'd be interesting to see what happens in Germany as well as they look at this enabling of Putin. Well, they were able to hold the line. They, you know, they still have a center-right government. But, you know, in Austria for a while, that wasn't the case. In Hungary, it's not really the case. Um, so there's a lot of countries, at least in the Eastern Bloc of, of Europe, where you've, you've seen a tip in one direction or the other. Um, it's not unreasonable to think of that in France, it could tip in one direction or the other. Fortunately, in the UK, or unfortunately, however you look at it, it's still really a two-party system. Um, for the most part, I think. So, I don't know. We're we're in a really uh, precarious moment in world history. I think. Yeah. By the way, I want to talk about one thing that I talked at the end of last year. I talked about just a very random thing um, about you know uh, Visa and Mastercard and how you could short them, um, or you know like basically like the payment networks. We're going to start to get you know dismantled this year. It's really interesting to see, I don't know if you guys have been really paying attention to all the activity that's been happening in payments over like the last literally 90 days, I think has been really incredible up until, you know, just today, you know, Visa and MasterCard, I think are doing the single dumbest thing they could do by being a duopoly, which is raising prices, especially into an inflationary moment, which just lacks complete knowledge and sensitivity of the moment. So dampen ac economic activity but also creates yeah. the incentives for disruption. Sure. Right? Because then the gap between you and your next clearest competitor becomes more obvious. And again, in capitalism, you compete away these advantages. And I just think that uh, the setup is becoming more and more obvious for the shift in payments. I just think it's quite interesting. So Dick Durbin actually today basically is going to create a big, you know, hubbub in the Senate around these increasing merchant fees, which will eventually spill over to consumers. There's some talk that, you know, uh, I, 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 what is it called? Zelly? Uh, is that how you pronounce it? Zelly, the, the, yeah. the, the, the inner bank payment system. People are talking about them converting that to becoming a more substantive payment system. And then this week, I was able to see a little bit under the hood of, you know, Solana Pay. And that's really exciting. So it's all coming, I think, like, uh, it's like a swarm of activity, uh, to dismantle these payments businesses. I just wanted to just, Give the 90 day update from our from our discussion in January. All right, everybody, uh, we will see you May 15th, 16th and 17th in Miami for the first all in summit now sold out. No more tickets available. There's a wait list, but we're not going to be able to get to anybody on it. Sorry, you can sign up and we'll make sure you know about next year. If there is a next year, this might be a one and done kind of situation. Three amazing parties. Sunday night is our poker tournament for charity. The top uh, it's gonna be a sit and go format. If you win your sit and go you go into a, a sit and go bake off and then you get to sit at the final table with the four besties the winners are going to get to make a donation to the charity of their choice uh paid for by the besties and uh, sunday night's party will be the goodfellas party monday is going to be the havana white party bring your linen sacks i know you got a whole closet full down there and then uh tuesday nights are miami vice party here are the mock-ups of is the this invites. a reveal this is the first time i'm seeing it yeah, Same too. Time yeah, the just audience. a little reveal there, they, there's a lot of work the copy i didn't write we're workshopping it it's just we we got a little uh what do they call that like a mood board it's a little bit of a mood board here's your uh wet your beaks party for sunday night it's gonna be a goodfellas theme should be a lot of fun this we is like it looks like goodfellas it looks like goodfellas we're gonna keep working on it uh wet your beaks probably not gonna be the name of your party but that's sunday night and then next up is our Havana White Party. Wow. Despite all the shit you take, uh, you do such a good job with this shit. I gotta Thank say. Thank you. And then we're gonna have this, our uh, this Buena Vista is, Social Club. I apologize, party. but I think this is complete dog shit, this one. Okay. The first well, one- It's supposed to be Buena Vista Social Club. You're just a heathen, you never saw that. The first picture. one is so good, this is horrendous. Well, I don't even know, what is this picture of? What this? Are, it's, it's, a, it's a theme on the Buena Vista Social Club. It's, a, it's not the right image, but we're workshopping it, like I said, but yep. that's gonna be a Havana white party. Everybody's gonna wear linens on Monday night. 
and this it's that's going to be at a beautiful you missed space. Moss name in that. I, like I said, this is just a designer okay. coming up with ideas, and then of course we're going to have our Miami Vice. We're going to rent a couple of um, oh that I like Miami Ooh, Ventures, yeah. <laughs> and so that there we are, hot. and so that should be our at four twenty Bitcoin Street. Your best eighties dress for Miami Ventures. So it's going to be three wow, killer parties. That is uh, that's hot. I think it's going to be a three great parties. <laughs> you have to, but everybody's going to have to get three great outfits. So linens are easy Jay, Monday night. Jay, Jay Cal, your, your thighs look really big in this photo. I'm well, just... this is fat Jay Cal. This is not 167 Jay Cal. This is 198 Jay Cal. On your left leg, you can't tell where your bottom part of the leg stops. Where well, your I'm sitting is. in a stool in that picture they got, but yeah. But it's like you have no knee. It's just like one big shank, like pork yeah. Well, shoulder. Well, you know what? It's when you're fat and you got fat suits, you know, everything's... F uh, listen, I'm looking at pictures of myself. Why didn't you guys fat shame me more? That's the question I have. Well, you guys you should have been just on top. You, you, you really look incredible. And then yesterday when I saw you, I was like, holy shit, this guy looks really fantastic. Look, there's no knee there. It's just... There's no knee. It's like no shank. Knee. It's like big shank. You know what? When you're a fat guy, you get fat suits. You just try to, you know... And now I'm having to rebuy... Look at that fat face. Wait, what's oh up with that hair? Please, zoom out. Oh, my God. Zoom out. Zoom out. Look terrible. Flat hair. Now, oh, Sack's look looking nice. No, you look good. I look Sachs fabulous. Looks good. Let's, no, look let's go with this one. You look let's great. go with this. You look great. Yeah. Chima we're gonna redo <laughs> mine i want all the photos done of vin j cow for the inspiration don't no double chin what are you doing you work for me don't yeah we need we you're need killing vin. me where's, where's my neck <laughs> now i got a neck again i found my neck everybody there you have it folks so uh i'm sorry if you did not get into the all-in summit but we've got a great lineup of speakers and events planned no press because well we have the same distribution but we will the press will be able to see all the talks. So all the talks will come out post event on the all in feed. So for the 10 days after the all in feed, you're going to get a show every day. And, and who are our edit. confirmed speakers at this point? Oh, my Lord, so many good ones. Hold on. Let me pull it up here. Keith Raboy. Palmer Lucky is coming. Uh, oh, good. So that's confirmed. That's awesome. Yeah, we got that confirmed. He's a big fan of Saxy Poo. The new website's up, by the way, and it looks beautiful. Oh, wow. Look at this. I so we this. have uh, Ryan Peterson, uh, Nate Silver. Brad yeah. Gerstner, uh, Claire uh, Vickle, who is amazing, uh, Mar Hershon, Palmer Lucky, Keith Raboy, Joe Lonsdale. Oh, you got Antonio to want to speak. Tim Ur uh, Antonio is now coming out of his shell. Antonio Tim Garcia Urban. Martinez. Nice. I mean, these are uh, Adina. You Hefes. should get, um, we should get some foreign policy folks too. I mean, yeah. well, if you guys wanted to do any fucking work, you could help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was just a grift you were doing. I didn't know it was serious. Now I'm now I may have to help. Yeah, no, you're going to be proud of this. Well, here's the thing that I'm going to yeah. be most proud of is the format. I have come up with a new concept of a format. I came up with a theme question that people can choose to answer or not, but the problem I want to solve, and it could be the problem I most want to solve. It could be the problem I want to see solved, the problem I'm thinking about. People will go up in most cases and give a 10 to 20 minute, call it a TED style talk, a solo dolo talk where they kind of talk about what they're working on in their lives, then they come and sit in a chair with two besties on either side. And then the four of us engage them in a conversation. While we're talking, we're going to have maybe five slides that producers will put together of data points, etc. So we all get educated, we pull up the slide. And then there'll be, you know, 600 people in the auditorium, 100 people in the simulcast room, we will take one question from the audience or two questions if we have time with each segment. And so you're going to get a lot of bestie action, but stimulated by bestie guesty positions. Um, and I think this is really what folks want. Now, if somebody doesn't want to give one, let's say Palmer just wants to talk, well, we'll just talk with Palmer. Um, and so th there's going to be an option. I told people you could, your position paper, your position statement could be five minutes, it could be 20. So I want to do something on uh, natural resource scarcity and uh, national security. So uh, Jim Latinsky, the CEO of MP Materials. Okay, you just all you got to do is email me the person's email address or introduce me and we'll set it so up. So we'll, we'll, we'll do something on like yeah. the supply chain of like rare earths and lithium yeah. nickel. Cobalt. Well, and so and then here's my other idea. So I, I told everybody so that the problem I'd like to solve there is energy independence for America. Perfect. So then, so then what do we're I gonna still do need to email you now? Just email me. But here's the thing okay. we're doing. I told everybody. But I, just, I just told you the. Yeah, we have yeah, Nick. Okay. We'll take a note. Yeah. Um, to remind you um, to get the email address. Here's what's going to happen. Okay, So you don't need me to email you. Uh, it, I mean, it, we don't want to guess the email if you have it and you know them. I mean, I know you want to do the least amount of work, but I need to get a producer's fee here. I don't know. You guys got to outvote Freeberg. Putting that aside, I'm me fine wetting with that. my beak. I'm fine with that too. 
Thank you. Then three, because that's how all in media is working now. It's just going to be votes. Well, why uh, don't you sign the LLC agreement? Did anybody sign it yet? I was going to review it well, to see somebody, what fucking poison some, pill Freeberg put in there. Can somebody, I, I'm not signing this shit till I have two lawyers look it over. Freeberg's got a poison pill in there. I, I don't know. know about you guys, but I just signed any random DocuSign that ends up in my inbox. I just <laughs> assume you know, you know I want to get to vetted. speak. You know, oh, I want to speak now, at the conference in okay. the last 30 days. Look, yeah, so I'd up. like to get I'd like to get Professor John Mearsheimer to speak. He's oh, a that'd be great. Yeah, he's a professor at the University of Chicago. He's been there 40 years. He's the leading. He's a leading theorist, you could say, of the school of thought called realism oh, yeah, uh, in, in foreign policy. And he has a track record of being right about all of America's foreign policy. Oh, wait, this is the guy you shared the video years. with, right? Yeah. So he's the guy who talked about like, the duopoly. Could, what do they call that? The mono dual tri world mono order nucleosis, multipolar, unipolar. unipolar when yeah, the yeah, I mean, look, was, he has a yeah. critique. He has a critique yes. of liberal interventionism, which has been the do dominant Fantastic. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. It's what got us into Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. He predicted all those things to be fiascos. He also predicted that our policy of constructive engagement towards China would ultimately backfire and be a disaster. And he has a very contrarian critique right now of our policy in Ukraine that's gone viral yes. on great, Twitter, great and it's gotten like 10 million plus views. He would be an incredible person to, to come speak. Well, here's what's happened while we invite people. You know, we, we invite some people. They don't know the show. We knew other people, and they're like, oh, my God, I love the show. I, I'll, I'm there. What, what's going to be interesting is the next 30 days, we're going to talk to each person about what, they, what topic they really want to, you know, double click on. And then we're going to pair people. So you might have Keith Raboy and Antonio, you know, you might have Tim Urban and Joe Lonsdale or whatever. And so hopefully we can find a little dynamic. Maybe people don't agree. Maybe they have, mm -hmm. you know, opposite positions. And then we're going to then have this great Socratic dialogue with everybody. And I think it's going to be a very fast paced type thing. And then hopefully the speakers sit in the VIP area. And then I'm going to have a runner there with a microphone or I might do it myself. So, you know, I might have Keith Raboy on in the morning, in the afternoon, he might want to chime in on Joe Lonsdale's talk, I run up to him with a microphone, etc. So uh, we got probably we're going to do two hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. So it's 10 to 12. So you can sleep in or come for coffee. If we stay late playing poker every night, it's going to be a gentle wake up. 12 to two is a nice lunch, healthy, three to five, nice con I'm sorry, two to five, three hours of nice content. Then you get a little break, you go to the parties. At the end of the parties, you never know, a poker table or two might be pulled out and we play a little cash game. Who knows? Anything's possible. So poker could be all three nights. I don't know. You know, this depends on the degeneracy level. Um, but I think it's going to be a fun time. I'm just asking nobody go ham on Sunday or Monday night, please. Tuesday night, you want to have a little extracurricular, you want to go a little late, Davey, Chamath, that's fine. But... Va bene, va bene, va bene. I want everybody in bed by midnight, Sunday night and Monday night. No crazy. All right, so what are the dates this thing again? Okay, it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Sunday, Monday. Of what? Of what? May 15, 16, 17. Okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God, what a shit show. And you better fucking fly some of these speakers out the tour. It's in a month. It is in a month. Yes, that's why I'm busting my ass on this. Okay, so, uh, Jake Allen, I'm going to introduce you to Latinsky so we can uh, slot him And in. if anybody, ha uh, we could use a couple more female speakers, people of color. I'm really trying to keep it diverse and have a lot of range of speakers. A lot of uh, David Stans said yes early. You got the Joe Lonsdale, you get Keith Raboys. They all like want to support David's team. I could use a couple people maybe with opposing viewpoints. So we're, we're trying to keep it a little bit wide. Uh, Barry Weiss may come. We're trying to work on Barry. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we should get uh, Kara Swisher great. can't make it. I wanted to have Barry and Kara Swisher. It doesn't seem like that oil and vinegar is going to happen. Can we, like uh, can we get Glenn Greenwald? But th that Glenn's right, right, right. You're getting, you're getting further and oh, further okay. to the right. No, what Glenn? I would like to have is somebody to Matt pair with Taibbi? Barry. Matt Taibbi? That's another kind of right guy. I would like no, to have somebody on the left who maybe represents. your definitions are all off, Jason. These definitions don't mean anything anymore. Okay, they're independent they're, critical thinkers. Okay, they're, fine. They're, they're, they, they originally came from the left. They're not like huge fans of unbridled capitalism, but they're more on the populist side. Listen, it's, if you it's this populist want to versus send an invite to anybody, Sachs, I would appreciate it. Particularly Peter Thiel, who's the you're the one person who can deliver it since you guys are besties. Bring us Peter Thiel. The guy spoke at a goddamn. All right, give me a cheap... give me a list. I'll invite Glenn. I'll invite Taibbi. I'll invite Peter. Oh great! Now we Maybe just lost we invite, half the audience. Try and invite Mirsha. <laughs> We're gonna have a protest outside. <laughs> I, I, I actually these are the most interesting people. Exactly. Peter Thiel is the most interesting for sure. 
I like Mike Taibbi, actually. I'll give you that. Matt here's the problem. Matt here's the problem. Sorry, Here's the problem with getting the people on the other side is that the people on the other side, again, it's not right versus left anymore. It's sort of populist versus elitist. And you already know what all the elitists are going to say. And they're too afraid to be on stage with people on the other side. But I mean, I think that you're associated with Peter Thiel with this a little bit charged and triggering for certain people. That's right. Huh. Yeah, exactly. That, that's why they don't, they don't believe well, in free I mean, speech. That's, they don't, I mean, they, people are like, how could you be friends with David? I'm like, because we love each other. And we're friends. Like. We're, we're besties. And they're like, well, but you disagree These are with tactics. them. Like, it's, it's contamination by association. Well, that's what so they're trying to do. That's, I mean, David, that's what they're trying to do to me right now. I'm getting the back channel. How could you do this with David Sachs? And I'm like, because he's my best friend. That's so why our my pod besties. is popular is we have four people who are friends who sometimes disagree with each other. The reason you can't create the show and still anywhere else. Friends. And right. And still yes, I'm friends. not giving up my friendship with David. The reason Sorry. you can't create the show anywhere else is because those people think they get contaminated if they even have a conversation with somebody on the other side of things. But you don't get that on your side. Correct. Peter because Thiel we is not coming speech. to you and saying, because we're intellectually be confident. With we're intellectually confident. We don't believe in shutting down the debate. Right. We believe in free speech. The other right. side, they're authoritarian yes. because they can't defend anything. They just well, cancel people. They're, they've lost the art of persuasion. I think they've given up their position would be they've given up trying to reach you. You just don't get it. They've given up trying to reach you. And I'm like, don't give up. Put up a fight. If you disagree with Sachs's position, it's not about reaching speech, me. Hold on. It's not about reaching me. It's about reaching all of them. Yes. All the people out engage there watching. Engage the debate. They don't want to de engage the debate because they can't win the debate because they don't know how to persuade. I beat you all every week do, in this debate. All they I know to do is you cancel. in this debate weekly. Look what I did all they, to you all in January All they know to do is 6th. cancel people. Yes. They're but so I mean, look, used to canceling people. I debate you every week, Sachs, and I own you half the time. Okay, if he's good. <laughs> Think so. <laughs> January 6th? We're going to release the January 6th tapes? That's oh, all you got. little excursion that's on all January 6th? You're like MSNBC. That's all you got. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sackett. And I said we open source it to the fans, and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, Ice Queen of Kinoa. Be. Be. What? <laughs> we need to get merch. Are I'm doing all